Happy Sabbath, everybody. That sounded like somebody. Happy Sabbath, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here with you today. Now, let me just say this. There's nothing wrong with being from Mississippi. Okay. Well, wait, wait, wait. Why are you clapping? Wait, wait. I'm from Alabama. Okay. Mobile, to be exact. So just want you to be aware of that. Um, it's, a, it's a pleasure, it's a joy to be here with you today. I have the opportunity to uh, share with you from the Word of God, as well as share with you what God has been doing in Benton Harbor uh, at Harbor of Hope. Would you say amen to that? Uh, and just kind of, uh, just a brief report, if you will. I want to share uh, on the screen, you'll see some images. Uh, one is this image of a program we got going on called Healthy Heroes. And that is where Pastor Walter, uh, who just shared the children's story, as well as some young people uh, on his team, uh, have been going around through the different uh, project areas, various neighborhoods in the city of Ben Harbor, and reaching 175 kids per week, sharing with them this great health message. Would you say amen? amen. Yes, yeah, so you can clap for that. Praise God. Uh, praise God. Also, also, uh, this past year, this past year, uh, with, rather this past 10 months, God has uh, given us uh, uh, 11 souls who were baptized, uh, and I'm proud to say that they're still in the church today. Amen to that. Um, we, we just completed on the June 28th, 29th, uh, a health fair, a health expo where we had uh, over 100 people to attend from the local community, uh, so many of them young people, uh, adults, older folk as well. And so we uh, thank the PT department uh, for sending some of their students out to be a blessing to us uh, with that venture as well. And so we praise God for that. And right now, even as I am speaking, we are in the middle of a evangelistic series uh, titled, It's All About Jesus. Uh, we started July the 11th, and thus far we've had uh, at least 30 non-Adventists in attendance. Overall attendance, about 200, uh, 150, 200 each night, and so we praise God for that. Uh, and so I'm delighted and excited about what God is doing in Benton Harbor, and I solicit your prayers for that. Also, I just want to tell you up front, during this message, I'm going to be making an appeal. And so I want to encourage you right now, if you could just begin to fill out the Connect card where it has your name, email address, city, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, because when the appeal comes, I want you to be very intentional about this, uh, the, the, m making the, the proper check that applies to you regarding what God would have you to do in terms of your next steps. I want to turn your attention now to the Word of God, Ezekiel, Ezekiel chapter 37, Ezekiel chapter 37. And I want to read the first six verses of Ezekiel chapter 37. When you have it, would you say amen? Ezekiel chapter 37, and we're going to look at this passage of Scripture and see what it has to say for us today in Ezekiel 37. The Bible says, the hand of the Lord came upon me and brought me out in the spirit of the Lord and set me down in the midst of the valley. And it was full of bones. Then he caused me to pass by them all around. And behold, there were very many in the open valley. And indeed, they were very dry, Ezekiel says. Verse 3, and he said to me, Son of man, can these bones live? So I answered, O Lord God, you know. Again, he said to me, prophesy to these bones and say to them, O dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, surely I will cause breath to enter into you and you shall live. I will put sinews on you and bring flesh upon you, cover you with skin and put breath in you, and you shall live. Then you shall know that I am the Lord. This morning, I want to talk to you today under the subject, yes, he can. Yes, he can. Let us pray. Father in heaven, it is your time now. I ask, O oh God, that you would do for your people that which I cannot do. 
I pray that you would encourage us. I pray that you would challenge us. I pray that you would inspire us. I pray that you would move us, O God. And that is why I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart would be acceptable in your sight and encouraging to your people. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Yes, he can. It was breaking news. It was exciting news for some people and others. It was disappointing news, but it was breaking news. It was a big, big deal. It was so big that it was on CNN, ESPN, 3AB. No, it wasn't on 3ABN. More like Fox Sports Channel. It was picked up by the L.A. Times. It was picked up by Sports Illustrated. In fact, Sports Illustrated was the magazine that actually broke this breaking news. Maybe you heard about it. Maybe you haven't. Well, in church today, I'm going to give you this breaking news as to what took place about a week ago. There was the article bold all on the front page of the Sports Illustrated magazine, and it said... I'm coming home. Ladies and gentlemen, the greatest basketball player on planet Earth right now, his name is LeBron James. And he wrote this article telling the entire world, I'm coming home. Now, why is this such a big deal? And why is this pastor talking about LeBron James? I believe there's something that we can learn from LeBron James today. And that is this. In 2010, LeBron James made another declaration that was very public. It was a bad declaration as well because he didn't even tell the team that he was leaving. But in 2010, he went on national television and he decided to tell everybody about this decision that he was making to take his talents from Cleveland Cavaliers to the South Beach, Miami. And I want you to know that that was big news, but it was devastating news. In fact, the fans of the Cleveland Cavaliers were so devastated that they had ceremonies where they were setting LeBron James jerseys on fire. Talk about people obsessed with sports. Lord have mercy. I like the game, but it ain't that deep. (laughs) So these people were mad. They were upset. They were devastated. They were hurt. They were were very disappointed because this young man who grew up right down the street in Akron, Ohio, he was drafted number one overall by his hometown Cleveland Cavaliers. And now he's dated us for four or five years and he's moving on. And he didn't even have the nerves to tell even the owner of the team or announce it to his teammates. He goes on live television and tell the world that he's breaking up with us. And so their response was a legitimate response. Now, years later, after playing with the Miami Heat and writing this article, I'm coming home. I believe there is something instructive for the house of God today. You see, LeBron James said in this letter, in this letter that he wrote, he said that there were some things, watch me, he said that there were some things that I could not learn had I stayed in Cleveland. He talked about the necessity of relocation for his personal maturation. I'm coming down your lane real quick. He said, he said, he said that there are some things that I learned by leaving that I couldn't have learned by staying. I learned to develop the talent around me. I learned how to endure unjust criticism. I learned how to make my teammates better. I learned how to be a champion. As a result of his relocation to a different destination, his game as a player, it matured and it grew and it developed. And as a result, his confidence and his ability to do great things and lead another team, his home team, got him to the point where now I'm able and equipped to go back home. Where is this preacher going today? 
I'm here to suggest to you today that the same thing that happened in the life of LeBron James is the same thing that we see in the life of biblical characters where God is taking his chosen one out of their current location and moving them to another situation to help their faith grow. What do you mean? What do you mean? Well, if you just go to the, 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 the first book of the Bible and you will see Adam, there were some things that Adam could not learn in the Garden of Eden when everything was perfect that he had to learn in adversity outside the garden. There were some things that Abraham could not learn if he was to stay in his land that God told him, look, I need you to go to a land that I'm going to show you. It's the promised land for right now. But in this journey, there are some things that Abraham was going to learn that he could not learn had he stayed where he was. In other words, there are some things that we just cannot learn during times of prosperity that only adversity can teach us. So it was with Ezekiel in Ezekiel chapter 37. The Bible tells us that God gives Ezekiel this vision. And the very first thing that God does in this vision, watch this. The very first thing God does in this vision is God relocates Ezekiel to a different location. The Bible says that the hand of the Lord came upon me and brought me out of, brought me out and set me down where? In the midst of a valley. He relocated him, put him at a different place. Not just any place, but the Bible says that he set him down in the midst of a valley. So watch this now. Ezekiel, Ezekiel goes into this vision now. And in this vision, God replaces him, uh, relocates him to a place where, where he opens his eyes. And now he sees he, that he is in a valley. And in the Bible, when you see, when you see a, a, a valley, uh, it's, it's, it's never a situation that is inspiring. It's more so a situation that is depressing, David, in fact, calls it, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. So, so this valley that Ezekiel is seeing, not only is it a valley of death based on other texts in the Bible, but the, ver the, the Word of God says that he sees in this valley, he makes an observation, and it is a valley full of bones. Ezekiel is looking at all of these bones. Wow. There are children bones and Teenage bones and young adult bones and, wow, middle-aged bones and elderly folk bones. Wow. What, 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 what is all? And as he takes a closer look, he recognizes that these bones, the Bible says, are very, very dry. Meaning then, they've been here for a long time. They've been decaying, they've been rottening. In other words, these bones are really, really dead. They're like very dead. Can you, can you be very dead? <laughs> are you dead? You're dead. But look, he says these things are very dry. What's up with this dryness? What's up? Why, why is this? Well, these bones represent, as we see in verse 11, these bones represent the state of the house of Israel. The people of God are in a state of depression right now. They're in captivity. Their hope, they say, it, they, all their hope is lost. They feel like they've been cut off. The temple has been destroyed. They've been taken into Babylonian captivity. And now these bones represent the people of God in this valley. I don't know about you, but sometimes I found myself discouraged and feeling down when God has taken me to a valley situation. Do I have some help in this house today? I know that somebody here today, you have experienced what it is like to be in a valley. Maybe you need some help this morning, so I'm going to help you out. Sometimes, sometimes we go through valleys, and we might not be in the valley ourselves, but, but, but we have family members who might be in the valley. Maybe that valley right now is your child, that son or that daughter. You, that you, you taught them everything that they need to know. You took them to Sabbath school every single Sabbath. You gave them all the healthy, healthiest food for their bodies. But for whatever reason, they decided to wander away, and you're looking at that situation, and it's a bad situation. It looks a little hopeless, and you feel like now you are in the valley. 
Sometimes we go through the valley of sickness or the valley of cancer, the valley of different diseases. Sometimes our relationship, it could be a marriage, it could be a, a, a job relationship, where our relationship seems like it is in a valley, very dry, even our relationship with God. Anybody ever experienced what it's like to have a dry relationship with Jesus? Where your prayers seem like they only hit the ceiling, not making it to heaven? Sometimes we find ourselves in the valley, and Ezekiel found himself in this valley. And while he was in the va- excuse me, while he was in the valley, he was observing a terrible, terrible, deplorable situation. And, 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 and then now, watch this. And then now God raises a question to Ezekiel. And I believe he raises that same question to us today. God raises this question to Ezekiel. Ezekiel, based on what you see, based on the dryness of these bones, based on your current location, I've got this question for you. Do you think... Can these bones live? Now, Ezekiel Ezekiel is getting ready to trip us out. Now, watch this. Ezekiel, looking at the situation, I mean, wow, these bones are not, they're not just bones, but they are dry bones. They're very dry bones. Ezekiel says, I'm going to play it safe. Oh, Lord, thou knowest. (laughs) Ezekiel, that's not what God asked you. It's a yes or no question. Can these dry bones live? Oh, God, thou knowest. That's, 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 that's not the question, Ezekiel. And I believe that sometimes, sometimes God is asking us specific questions about his ability. This question had to do with God's ability to do the impossibility. And whether or not Ezekiel would believe God to be able to do that. It kind of reminds me of the man who was at the well for 38 years, or at the pool rather, for 38 years, and Jesus shows up, the, the, the one who can heal anybody. Jesus shows up and asks the man, do you want to be made well? Well, Lord, every time I try to go to the pool, somebody step over me. and That's not the question. The question is, do you want to be made well? And I believe, listen, I believe that God asks us these questions. God says, look, as you look at that, as you look at the dry bones that you see in your life, As you look at your child, as you look at your son, as you look at your marriage, as you look at yourself, as you look at those defects in your character, I've got a question for you. Do you think that it is possible for God to bring restoration from those dry bones? And I'm here to tell you today that God wants to get me and he wants to get you to the place where we can say, yes, Lord, absolutely. Why? Because he can. He is able, the Bible says, to do exceedingly and abundantly above all we can ask, think, or imagine. God asked the question. I like when God starts asking questions about himself. Is there anything too hard for God? Is there anything too hard for God? Absolutely not. If God can speak and things just come into existence out of nowhere, nothing's too hard for God. It's not impossible for God to bring your prodigal son back home. It's not impossible for God to bring your wayward daughter back home. It's not impossible for God to restore your broken marriage. I'm here to tell you today that it's possible for these dry bones to live. And as I walk, as I walk, as I walk, as I walk through my city, that's right, I call it my city. As I walk through the city of Ben Harbor and I run into people who, 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 who have been abused by life, who've been abandoned by their fathers, who've been battered by some man. As I walk through the streets and as I meet people and greet people and I see people who've been controlled by drugs and alcohol, as I see generation after generation, as I look in people's eyes, 
and I see this sense of hopelessness, I am convinced that the same God who spoke to those dry bones in the Word of God is the same God who can speak to the life of this individual and say to them, yes, there is still hope for you. Yes, these dry bones can live. As a matter of fact, I read in the Spirit of Prophecy, I have a quote for you. I want you to look at this. Uh, she says about these, these, these souls, right, or these, these dry bones. As much as these dry bones apply to the church of God, they also apply to the people that we're seeking to save. Notice with me on the screen. The souls of those whom we desire to save are like the representation which Ezekiel saw in vision, a valley of dry bones. They are dead in trespasses and sins, but God would have us, Lord have mercy, but God would have us deal with them as though they were what? Living. It might look like a hopeless situation, but you have to speak to it as if it is a living situation. I'm so glad, I'm so glad, I'm so glad. I told you we're in the middle of an evangelistic series right now. And I met this lady, she came to our church, and she just said, I, she just came, she's not even baptized yet. She said, I want to I wanna serve. I feel God is leading me to this church. I began to have, I began to have a conversation about the, you know, with this woman just about her story and where she came from and what she's going through. Come to find out this lady, oh, Lord, have mercy, bless her heart. This lady was sexually assaulted by a police officer of Ben Harbor. She began to tell me about, about, about just the crying, the tears, crying herself to sleep for the past two years. This thing happened about two years ago. Just crying herself to sleep and, and, and taking medication. It's affected not only her, but her sister and her daughter. And, and, and all of them, I'm talking about just crying, all, just, just crying. Just abused by life. I talked to another woman who, when she was just, Lord have mercy, when she was just three years old, Three years old, she was looking out the window and she saw her, 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 her stepfather beating her mother with a gun and a baseball bat. Three years old, watching this, traumatized, devastated, to the point where it has affected her her entire life. Let me tell you something. It is impossible, Lord have mercy, to, 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 to be a sane person having gone through something like that without Jesus. When I look at these folk, though, and I have that in mind, those inspiring words, looking at them as though they were living, even though they seem hopeless, I get encouraged. I get revived. So this lady comes, and she's telling me about her life story and so on and so forth. And she says, look, 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 when this evangelist is coming up, I want to go. She came on the first night. She said, Pastor, I feel good. I feel good, Pastor. I'm going to keep on going. I said, yeah, you got to keep on coming because it's more for where that came from. So she came on the second night. Pastor, every time I come, look, Pastor, I start sleeping better at night. Hallelujah. You got to come on tomorrow night. I'm coming, Pastor. As a matter of fact, when I come tomorrow night, Pastor, look, I'm going to tell my sister, I'm going to tell my daughter. As a matter of fact, they can see change in me already. So I went to go and pick up the whole family now. Come back the next night, she got somebody else she invited. There's hope for any situation that looks hopeless in the eyes of man. So God asked this question now. God asked this question to Ezekiel. Hey, 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 it looks hopeless. Let me ask you this. Can these dry bones live? This question was a test of his faith. Let me tell you something. Let me tell you something. Where are you going with this? Where are you going with this? Let me tell you something. I've been very hesitant. I've been very hesitant to make this kind of appeal. You know, this is my third time speaking here. I've been very hesitant to make this kind of appeal that I'm getting ready to make right now, this kind of push, this kind of challenge. Part of it because I've been here for 19 months and I've still been trying to figure out, you know, what is God's vision for Benton Harbor? What is God's vision for Harbor Folk? Where is God trying to take us? But I can say to you right now, now it's clearer. It's, it's, it's far more clearer now. So I can make this appeal. Listen, listen, listen. When we talk about relocation, 
And God trying to move people out of their current location and put them in a different situation to grow their faith so their faith can mature. I'm here to suggest to you today, and I've been praying about this. I've been praying for you. There are some people who are sitting here now under the sound of my voice. You don't need to be here anymore. You need to come to Harbor of Hope. That's not a joke. No, no, hear, hear, hear what I'm saying. And I'm going to show you. I'm going to show you something right now that you, know, you might not believe the preacher, but you can believe the, the prophet. Okay. Listen to what I'm saying. There are some of us right now who are sitting in here with the talents that God has given you. You need to take your talents from Bering Springs to Ben Harbor. The basketball people got that. No, seriously, seriously, seriously. You know, I, 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 I wouldn't ask you to do that. I wouldn't ask you to do that, you know, uh, five months ago or, or, or eight months ago. I wouldn't ask you to. I am convinced. Listen to what I'm saying. I have been praying for you. Sabbath school teacher, I've been praying for you. Pathfinder leader, I've been praying for you. Listen, this is the Macedonian cry. Come over and help us. This is it. This is the Macedonian cry. Let me tell you something. When I walk through the streets of, of, of Ben Harbor and, and, and when I interact with people and I look at the school system that's $15 million in debt, when I look at a school system that's not giving kids homework, when I look at a school system where kids are graduating 18 years old, 19 years old, and don't even know how to read. Not all of them, but a lot of them that I met. And I say to myself, I say to myself, I say to myself, you mean to tell me that we have a university less than 20 minutes away? We got a university, we got a whole bunch of educated Seventh-day Adventist people with this last day message who claim to believe that Jesus is coming soon. And you mean to tell me kids can't get somebody to come to them? Oh, yeah, this has this, this been 19 months in the making. <laughs> it's clearer now. I can speak like this. It's clearer now. Listen, listen, God is getting, oh my goodness, we celebrate 10 years, but the best is yet to come. The best is yet to come. Listen, there were some things that I could learn in Yazoo City, Mississippi, or Rolling Fork, Mississippi, the first district that I pastored, that, God, I, I, that, 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 that I couldn't learn there that I can only learn here. And there are some things, there are some things that you're just not going to learn by sitting up in here listening to all these great sermons. Oh, the pastor's coming down hard today. <laughs> it's all right. I, I love you. Look, it's not for, listen, it's not for everybody. I understand that. It's not for everybody. So God, watch this. God, God is speaking to Ezekiel, and the reason why God is speaking to Ezekiel, a part of God showing Ezekiel this vision is, look, he relocates him for the purpose of observing a terrible situation, and then he asks this question, but after this question comes an invitation. God knows where Ezekiel's faith is. God knew that he was going to get his old holy answer, O Lord, thou knowest. God knew that. So now God invites him to participate in his plan of restoring this nation. So you got Ezekiel's observation. God extends an invitation to help in the plan of restoration. God is looking for people to participate in the restoration of this community that we have adopted, Benton Harbor. Listen to me, listen to me, listen to me. Harbor Shores is not enough. It's, Harbor Shores is not going to do it. You can go out there and play golf all day long. But that kid still can't read. That parent still don't know how to raise them four kids. Yep, she made a terrible decision. She sure did. That was bad. That deal, how you going to have three different baby daddies? That, yeah, I, I know. It's terrible. But guess what? Some people make decisions based on the fact that they just don't know. God is looking for somebody to participate and say, here I am, Lord, send me. I can teach them the way. Now, 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 now I'm calling. I'm, 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 I believe that there are at least 20 people here today. 
who've been praying about this thing, who've thought about this thing, or you just not satisfied with your current relationship with God. you probably in easy mode. you just retired or whatever, or it's the summertime or whatever. I don't know. But I believe that if you want your faith to grow, you not only should relocate and go somewhere where you can exercise your faith, but you actually need to. See, 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 you coming to Ben Harbor, you coming to Harbor of Hope, it's not for you to come save Harbor of Hope. God is trying to save you. You need some help. You need some help. Let's go to the screen. Let's go to the screen. Let's go to the screen. Next slide. Next slide, please. Watch this. Watch this. Watch this. Our need for participation in divine restoration. This is, this is coming from the prophet, okay? She says, paragraph before this, she's talking about the needs of poor people. All right? Now she says, the people of God are equally in need of opportunities that draw out their sympathies, that give efficiency to their prayers and develop in them a, a character like that of the divine pattern. I ain't finished. It is to provide these opportunities that God has placed among us the poor, the unfortunate, the sick, and the suffering. Listen, if you want your faith to mature, allow God to relocate you in a place where your sympathies will be drawn out and your prayers will become more efficient. Listen, in Desire of Ages, the chapter, the least of these, one of my, one of my, one of my, uh, one, one quote rather that really just struck me. She says that many Christians, Lord help us, many Christians never pass the mere alphabet of the Christian experience because they do not engage in serving the least of these. There are some of us in here right now who are still in elementary school and we've been in elementary school for 30 years. Did that just go over your head? There are some of us who've been in a church for 15, 20 years. Yet we're still in the alphabets of our Christian experience. What does that look like? You've probably heard me say it before. I say it again. If I come to you and I say, look, I am a barber and I've never cut anybody's hair. Am I a barber? If I come to you and I say, look, I am a master chef. I can cook anything, but I've never made a dish. Am I a chef? Oh, I can bake the finest cakes and the most tasteful, delicious muffins, but I've never baked a thing in my life. Am I really a baker? Come on, talk to me. Don't be scared. If I say I am a disciple, but I've never made a disciple, uh-oh. Am I really a disciple? There's good news in this text, folks. And the good news is this. As Ezekiel begins to participate in this plan of divine restoration, the Bible tells us that something begins to happen. Something begins to happen. Ezekiel had to, 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 to move past the doubt. He had to move past anything that would keep him from participating. And once he did, something began to happen. The Bible says that God told Ezekiel as a part of his participation was that, 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 that he was to speak to the bones. He was to declare the word of God to the bones. Now, now, now understand this. Understand this. In order to speak to the bones and the bones to actually hear what you're speaking, you got to be near the bones. We got one person in the house of God got that this morning. You have to be near the bones so the bones can actually hear what you are saying. Which goes back to relocation. But this is what I discovered. Once you begin speaking, once you begin speaking the word of God to the, to the dry bones, once you begin pronouncing what thus said the Lord to the dry bones, the Bible says that the bones will start coming together. There was a rattling noise that Ezekiel heard once he began speaking to these bones. And, 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 and bones began to connect. And then uh, tendons came on and, and, and flesh and skin. And now... 
you have a, a body that is there, some hope has been spoken to this situation. But it doesn't stop there. It doesn't stop there. It doesn't stop there. What happens now is Ezekiel realizes, as we will realize when we participate in divine restoration, that, that, that it's not just enough for me to speak the word of God to people. The spirit of God has to come in and activate life. And I believe that sometimes we get so caught up in speaking and preaching and teaching and all that kind of stuff and depending on our programs and our rhetoric or what have you, rather than praying that the Spirit of God come in and activate and bring to life what the Word of God is saying. So we can't just be preaching and teaching. We got to pray and ask the Spirit of God to do what only God can do. Now I want to Bring this thing to a close in just a minute. But I want to say this to you, though. I know somebody may be saying, well, Pastor, you've been talking a lot about coming to Ben Harbor and serving. And you may say, well, look, I, man, I, I don't know about that because, you know, I didn't grow up in the ghetto, Pastor. I'm not from the hood. Okay, so how, 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 you know, how am I going to be able to relate to my brothers and sisters. That's how I want you to refer to my brothers and sisters in Ben Hall. Same family, just different address. Amen. I can't relate. Well, look, I want to, I want, I want to tell you. I want to tell you. First of all, first of all, uh, uh, I, I believe God is raising up a great army, and I happen to be uh, uh, one of the generals. Okay? And as a general, when I do recruiting, I'm not going to let my potential soldiers go out there and get whooped without getting trained. Oh, it makes sense, right? Yeah, I won't put you out there on Broadway and Empire and tell me you knocking on doors and I just seen to the worst neighborhood. Now, some of y'all just took note. Okay, don't go to Broadway and don't go to Empire. It's all right, though. It's all right. It's all right. Here's the point I'm saying. Look, look, look. Ben Harbor really isn't as bad as you read about in the paper. It's not. It's really not. Let me give you a little ghetto, this is ghetto one-on-one. Take notice. This is ghetto one-on-one. All right, let me get ready to educate you real quick. Okay. Thugs, the thugs, you know, the hard people with the pants sagging and the dreadlocks and, you know, the, that, that kind of thing, are really, really big teddy bears. Yeah, I, 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 I used to act like one. Really big teddy bears. Because deep down inside, what's on the outside, the hard look and the sagging pants and the, and, and, and the, and, and the just mean countenance that's on their face, is really hiding the fact that, man, my, daddy, my, my, my dad abandoned me when I was a kid. So I don't know how to deal with that. So I deal with it the way that I see portrayed on the me- in the media. And, 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 oh, okay, so I, I can look up to this rapper. I can look up to that rapper. So I'm going to, I'm going to try to... Uh, personify that. And so when people come in my neighborhood, you know, I'm just going to look. Let me tell you something. Let me tell you something. No, seriously, let me tell you something. Let me tell you something. Love begets love. Hope begets hope. It doesn't matter what color you are. The question is, do you believe that these dry bones can live? Do you believe that? That's the question. Do you believe that these dry bones can live? And if you believe that, if you believe that, and you are willing, God can use you no matter what race you are. And he wants to use you. I've been praying that he will use you. I've been praying that God will move on the hearts of at least 20 people in here. Now, I was joking with Hosea earlier uh, before I came up, and he said, man, I'm putting you on the spot, Hosea. It's okay, though. I love you. still love you. He said, man, you can't be, we, we, we can't be, uh, uh, you can't be doing no, steep, no sheep stealing now. Some of y'all got that. I said, nah, man, you know, did you hear, hear Pastor Dwight? We all won. So I'm just trying to rearrange some of the sheep. <laughs> That's all. Uh, it, it's another farm out there. We need some sheep out there. <laughs> I want you to know this, and we, we're bringing this to a close. We're bringing this to a close, and I want to go to the screen. There's a uh, picture of the White House. 
1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. I did a little, you know, reading about wars and, 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 you know, how decisions are made about when we go to war and who goes to war and that kind of thing. And, you know, the protocol usually is that, you know, the po folks in the White House will make the final call to go to war. All right, that's usually how it's supposed to go. And so you have the White House. And in the White House, you know, the nice, oh, man, beautiful grass. Got the nice little bushes outside, well trimmed. The red flowers. Doesn't that look nice? Comfortable, right? Oh, cozy inside that place. And then you have the Pentagon, kind of like the headquarters for all military operations, right? People end up in, having conversations, making decisions about who's going to blow up who and what ship to send and all that kind of stuff. Now, 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 when you talk about war, war is very different from the folk who's sitting in the White House and in the Pentagon than the people who are actually getting on that plane. Oh, it's a different story for these guys. Because they're getting on now, they recognize that I might not come back. I'm putting something on the line. And then it's a total different story when you are actually out on the battlefield and the war is raging and bullets are flying across your head and, 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 and grenades are being thrown and there's smoke all over the place and you, it's hard to tell who's on your team or who's not on your team. The battle gets very, very rough on the battlefield. What I've discovered is that when it comes to God's army being engaged in spiritual warfare, those of us who are on the battlefield have a tendency to be the ones with the greatest faith. Some of y'all are looking at me like you don't believe that. But let me tell you something. Since I was a student, the day I gave my life to Jesus, from the time I gave my life to these, at this, this point right here, I found myself knocking on doors, just engaging with people. And I've noticed that the times where I stop being actively involved in ministry, my faith in God does this. It shrinks. It's like exercising. When you work out, you get bigger muscles. When you don't, your muscles begin to shrink. Your faith is the same way, and it has to be exercised in Christian warfare and trying to lead lost people to Jesus. So I'm here to recruit today, and I want to, I'm not here by myself. Can you show that picture right there? There you go, there you go, yeah. Yeah. Now, now again, I want you to know that this, 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 is not, this is not for everybody. And I'm not, I'm not seeking to uh, uh, make anybody feel bad or, no, 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 no. There are three ways you can support Harbor of Hope. Your physical presence, your prayers, your pocketbook. Come on, say amen. amen. I'm speaking today, I'm speaking today for all of those. But there's a special appeal that I want to make today. There's a special appeal that I want to make today. You can pull out your connect cards right now. There's a very special appeal I want to make today. If someone doesn't have, if you do not have a connect card, just raise your hand. If you do not have a connect card, the ushers will come by and pass you one. I'm asking you to just raise your hand, uh, and, and they will come by and they will give you one. And if those of you have your connect card already, if you could at this time, make sure you fill out your information, especially your email, because on the back where it says, my next step today is, I want to walk you through this, all right? And the first one is this, I will believe God for the impossible in my life. If you're going to believe God for the impossible in your life, then I want to encourage you to check that one off right there. God, when I look at situations in my life that seem like they are dry bones, when I look at my finances, when I look at my health, when I look at a relationship, and it seems impossible, God, I'm going to believe you on this thing. I want you to put a check mark right there. And then if you want to say, hey, I will pray for Harbor of Hope, and I would like to receive their monthly newsletter. I want to receive the newsletter from Harbor of Hope. Listen, I want you to check right there because we need your prayers, and we also want to keep you informed about what's happening at Harbor of Hope every time we send out a newsletter. All right, now here's the very special appeal. This is the special appeal. The special appeal is this. I am interested 
in participating and would like to learn how I can serve. I want to help make a difference in the community of Benton Harbor. I want to offer my talents. I want to offer my energy. I want to offer my time. I am interested. I'm not saying making a commitment, but you're saying I am interested. The reason why it's important for you to check that one right there is because three weeks from now, Three weeks from now, let me say that again. Three weeks from now, we're going to hold an interest meeting right here at PMC. It'll probably be downstairs in the Cummins area. And I want to be able to notify you when of the exact date and time and so on and so forth. So if you, were, if you are interested and you want to learn how you can serve, you want to see the overall vision and where God is taking hard with hope, then I want you to make sure you check. I am interested in participating and would like to learn how I can serve. And lastly, I'm, I'm so glad God is so God has been gracious to us that we have some donors who have stepped up and said, hey, we, we, we like what you're doing and we want to support you. In fact, we're going to make a matching donation contribution. Would you say amen to that? If you are willing to give a contribution during the matching donation window of July 19th, to August 19th, that's 30 days, July 19th to August 19th, I want to encourage you to put a check right there, and you can make that contribution today, beginning today. And what you would have to do on your tithe envelope is you would have to write Harbor of Hope on your tithe envelope. It's not printed on there. You have to write Harbor of Hope on your tithe envelope to make sure that it becomes a part of the matching donation window. So I'm encouraging you to please, please do that. And last but not least, last but not least, God has been good to me and my family and him bringing us up here has really grown and stretched my faith. I've seen things happen. I've seen things happen in the, in the lives of people that we've been working with that some would have said was impossible to happen, even myself at some times. And I'm also proud today. I have, there's, there's a young man in here today right now who some of our Bible workers met out in the community. Wonderful young man. Hasn't been in Ben Harbor for longer than three days. And these Bible workers came knocking on his door telling him about this revival. And he came out and he's been faithful coming night after night after night after night. In fact, he's sitting over there. You wave to him. Raise your hand. Raise your hand. There he is right there. Praise God for you, Brother Princess. Praise God for you. There, there, are, there, there are more young people. There are more out there, adults, young people, who need somebody to come and participate in their lives to be a part of God's process of divine restoration for them. And I'm just wondering if you're here today. At this time, if you have checked out, if you feel, feel, filled out and, and put check marks by my next step today is, or if you're interested in any of the other things in the I'm interested in box, please check those as well. But I want to call forth the deacons at this time to come and take up the offering, the tithing offering for today, and make sure that you come and put your connect card inside of the offering once it passes around.